Welcome to the New Books Network. How did organized religion stand up to the moral challenge of the Holocaust? We are honored to have an outstanding scholar of the subject with us today, David Kurtzer's new book, The Pope at War, is destined to be the most important account of Pope Pius XII and the role he played behind the scenes during the course of the Second World War. Welcome to the Van Leer Institute series on ideas. I'm Renee Garfinkel, your host, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome David Kurtzer to the show today to talk about the Pope at War, the secret history of Pius XII, Mussolini, and Hitler. David Kurtzer, welcome to the podcast. Nice to be with you. Thank you. You've dedicated your career to Vatican scholarship, uh, but your interest in the topic isn't only academic. Tell us about your father's connection to Italy in the Second World War and how his experiences impacted you. Yes. Well, in fact, there is a personal connection here as well, because uh, growing up, I was born a little bit after the war, and my father was a, a rabbi and a Jewish chaplain in the U.S. Army. Uh, He was with the troops who landed at Anzio Beachhead, south of uh, about 30 miles south of Rome. In uh, the troops landed January 1944. He joined them a little later, and uh, he there spent months there, holding services, holding uh, Jewish funerals, uh, visiting the hospital. Uh, Before with the troops, he was was with them the day they liberated Rome in early June 1944. Uh, And then, in fact, that first uh, Friday night, uh, Shabbos evening, he, together with the chief rabbi of Rome, conducted the first service in the first liberated synagogue of uh, occupied Europe, a very dramatic uh, affair. So I kind of grew up with uh, stories of the war of Italy and of uh, of the Jewish uh, community, of course, of the Holocaust as well. Uh, We also, my family had, the year before I was born, taken in a a uh, sole survivor of the Holocaust, uh, a young girl whose parents and uh, siblings had been murdered at Auschwitz. So all this is, you know, has a kind of personal meaning for me as well. Uh, of course, then I have my academic interests, so they kind of converged in this case. Uh, your newest book, The Pope at War, is based on documents the Vatican kept secret until 2020, 75 years after the war ended. Why were they hidden for so long, and how did you finally gain access to them? Well, there had been pressure on the Vatican to make these documents, particularly for World War II, uh, public to to scholars for now decades because of the controversy over the behavior of the Pope during the war and his silence during the Holocaust. Uh, But that said, I mean, archives generally are closed for a period of time. It's not... uh, uncommon for archives to be closed, state archives for 50 years or 75 years. In the case of the Vatican, it goes by papacy. So it's up to the current pope to uh, decide to order the archives open for the next papacy whose papers are yet to be opened. And so it's not that unusual that it took as many years as it did. I think there were hopes that it would be um, a shorter period of waiting than usual just because of all the controversy and because the uh, Vatican has taken a rather strong position about its heroic uh, activities during the war. Um, finally, Pope Francis did decide, uh, he made an announcement in 2019 that the following year, 2020, uh, the archives for the uh, papacy of Pius XII and therefore for Vatic- for the uh, years of World War II uh, would be open to scholars. And uh, that's why on March 2nd, 2020, the day they opened, I was waiting outside the door of the main apostolic archive uh, to get to work. I, I didn't realize that it went according to the popes. I, I, um, I learned something. Thank you. Uh, it, it, not all popes are the same. That's clear. And if one didn't know that before they read this book, it's clear from your book. So talk a bit about the personality and background differences and the political differences between post, Pope Pius XI and his successor, Pius XII. Well, Pius XI came into office, was elected to the papacy in 1922, which was the same year Mussolini came to power as prime minister of Italy. 
uh, and he would work out an arrangement with Mussolini uh, that the Vatican strongly supported that, among other things, established Vatican City as a sovereign entity in 1929, got rid of the separation of church and state, gave all sorts of privileges to the church, uh, all in exchange for strong church support for the fascist regime in Italy. Um, however, by the mid-1930s, as Mussolini began to flirt more and more and embrace more and more uh, Hitler as alliance with Nazi Germany, the Pope Pius XI became very concerned because while he had a positive view of the Italian fascist regime and its very pro-church policy, he had a very negative view of the Hitler regime, which he saw as a pagan uh, religion, which was trying to undermine the influence of the Catholic Church in Germany. Uh, so by the end of uh, his, and I should say one other thing is he was rather um, emotional or temperamental Pope. So if he were angry with a foreign ambassador, his country's behavior, he would call him in, shout at him, pound his fist on his desk and so on. This is kind of the opposite of the very diplomatic uh, follower, Pius XII, who comes to uh, the papacy in March of 1939. So just before World War II gets started. And uh, Pius XII came from what's called black aristocracy, that his family had uh, in Rome had been very close to the popes for uh, three generations. His father was dean of the uh, lawyers of the, uh, of the uh, Vatican. Um, so, and he himself had uh, never been a pastoral in a pastoral role. He had always been right from the time of his ordination, a member of the uh, Secretary of State, then he spent 12 years, 1917 to 1929, as nuncio in Germany. So he got to know Germany intimately, spoke German fluently. Uh, so in the last months of Pius XI's life, his anger at the Nazi regime uh, was reflected in the fact that he had the Vatican Daily Newspaper almost on a daily basis uh, publish strong criticisms, attacks on the German regime, having nothing to do with Jews, by the way, but having to do with its uh, treatment of the Catholic Church in Germany. Uh, when Pius XII was elected in early March uh, 1939, uh, one of the first things he did is order the Vatican newspaper to stop all attacks on Germany. And uh, this would lead Hitler to see an opportunity. The new documents that you had access to describe negotiations between the Pope and Hitler's envoy in 1939. What were they negotiating about? Yes, there were those, some people who said that there'd be nothing new in these Vatican archives when they were open because the Vatican, because of the criticism uh, about the silence the Pope had back between 1965 and 1981, uh, published 12 volumes of papers uh, of archival documents from the war years bearing on the war. And so their position, at least the position of some, was, well, everything important has already been published. Uh, but one of the things I discovered once they let us into the archives was this is not true at all, that there are many dramatic and important documents that had not been made public. And among them, probably the most surprising uh, of all, their ability to keep this secret for over 80 years, was that shortly within weeks of uh, Pius XII's election to the papacy, Hitler, seeing an opportunity, decided to send a secret envoy to enter into negotiations with the Pope. And those negotiations took place over many months. Uh, we found in these newly opened archives, uh, not only evidence of their talks, but actual uh, more or less transcripts of their talks. It seems that the Pope kept in an adjacent room a German, a native German uh, prelate who recorded their conversations, which by the way, were held in German. Uh, so we now not only know about these, but we have more or less transcripts of what was said. And what were they negotiating about? Well, the um, Pope was concerned to, uh, as he saw it, as his predecessor had seen it, the re Nazi regime had been um, getting in the way of the church's influence in, in a variety of ways, had been closing down parochial schools. Hitler didn't like uh, children going to parochial schools. He wanted them to go to state schools where they'd be indoctrinated in Nazi ideology. Uh, Hitler was closing down various uh, seminaries and other Catholic institutions. 
so this is what the Pope was concerned about to try to convince Hitler that it was his in, interest to um, more or less do what uh, Mussolini had done, which is make peace with the church that it would be in their mutual interest and tried to convince uh, Hitler's envoy of this. Hitler basically uh, was not happy about the criticism that the previous Pope had been expressing toward his regime. A uh, large majority of his, uh, excuse me, minority, maybe about 40% once Austria had been included in the Third Reich uh, of the population of the Third Reich was Catholic. Uh, so it was in Hitler's interest, certainly not to have the Pope seen as uh, being critical of him. So he wanted to keep the Pope uh, silent in, in that sense. Like France and Austria, the Vatican never before, uh, never had really owned up to its role in the Holocaust. Uh, given the level of papal denial of any responsibility, uh, how has the Vatican responded to your new book? Um, unfortunately, not well. The uh, Italian edition of the book came out just a couple of weeks before the English edition. Um, actually, there's a German edition that just uh, came out in early March. Uh, and there's a British edition and other editions on the way. But when the Italian edition came out a week later, the Vatican Daily newspaper, Elisabetta Romano, uh, devoted a full page to denouncing the book. And two days later, the daily newspaper of the uh, Roman Catholic hierarchy of Italy, L'Avenire, uh, published another full page uh, denunciation of the book. Uh, the only difference being the latter author apparently never read a page of the book, but sort of cribbed from the, the Vatican newspaper and added some additional um, charges of its own. So uh, unfortunately, the uh, Vatican is sticking by this narrative that it had always been anti-fascist, it had always been anti-Nazi, that it had um, saved huge numbers of Jews by its uh, policy of remaining silent and so forth. Um, this is disturbing, I think. Uh, that said, it should be acknowledged that a number of national churches in Europe, including Germany, the German hierarchy in a statement of... Uh, early 2020, um, but some of the other uh, churches as well, national churches as well, including French church, have acknowledged their role and uh, asked apologies in the case most recently of the German church, acknowledging that they had been urging all good Catholics to go to war at Hitler's cause and had never uh, spoken out against the, uh, the extermination of Europe's Jews. Uh, while it was going on and, and while it was going on and who was committing it, of course, there were people who um, didn't consider themselves pagan. They considered themselves Christian, whether Protestant or Catholic. Oh, I, I understand. I understand that. Uh, did they object in any uh, substantial way on the facts or is it just that they interpreted their motivations more positively? Well, they uh, they can't really dispute the facts in the book, which are uh, from the archives, including the Vatican archives. There are about 8,000 pages of documents from the newly opened Vatican archives that were one of the bases of the book, along with the archives in uh, Italy, that is the Italian fascist government's archives, the uh, German government's archives, the French, British, and American archives. So it's based on tens of thousands of pages of archival evidence. And uh, so this really can't be disputed. Instead, there's kind of a combination of approaches uh, saying, you know, I didn't uh, include uh, the fact that, you know, certain um, convents had uh, saved Jews during the war, protected Jews during the war, and uh, this kind of thing, plus kind of uh, speculation that, oh, if uh, the Pope had spoken out, all sorts of terrible things would have happened to Jews, uh, as if uh, Hitler wasn't already trying to exterminate all of Europe's Jews. Right. Well, you know, we all have ways of rationalizing our actions to avoid recognizing unpleasant, difficult, unflattering realities. Uh, one of the Pope's ways was to distinguish between those he considered good fascists from the bad fascists. What was the distinction in his mind? The distinction was those who supported uh, the church and the bad fascists were the anti-clerical fascists. Now we're talking about uh, Italians, but even in the case of the Nazis, 
um, there was a dis distinction between the the good Nazis and the bad Nazis. I mean, the uh, from the church point of view, uh, the for example, the German ambassadors to the Holy See were seen as good Germans or good Nazis, and um, these were the enablers of the Nazi regime, the people who you know probably thought Hitler was. Uh, uh, you know, outrageous in many respects, but uh, did everything they could to smooth relations. In this case, uh, between the Holy See, the Church, and the uh, and the na National Socialist regime. So, you know, this this would be the distinction attitude toward the Church. Uh, I thought you were very even-handed in the way you dealt with uh, Pope Pius the Twelfth. Uh, he emerges as not an evil figure but rather a weak man. Um, nevertheless, as head of the church that claims to be universal, he tried only to save the Italian Jews who had converted to Catholicism and failed even at that modest goal. Tell us that story. Yes, well, it turns out that the uh, for the church, a very important distinction was between Jews who had been baptized uh, and those who, who remained Jews. And uh, there are many kind of elements of this story, but uh, maybe the most dramatic concerns October 16th, 1943, the uh, notorious date of the roundup of, uh, it, of Rome's Jews. Uh, so I think this gives you, uh, you know, one good illustration of this, which is, uh, so this is the day when basically Hitler sends 350 SS to Rome. Uh, they will go around beginning at dawn, uh, Saturday morning. So it's uh, Sabbath, Shabbos, and uh, with uh, lists of names of all the Jews in Rome, go door to door and seize all the Jews, men, women, children, and send them in uh, tarpaulin-covered uh, trucks to a holding center, which is in a military college, right literally outside the walls, the old walls of Vatican City. And they're held there for two days. Uh, 1,259 are arrested that are on their list of the Jews of Rome. Uh, the train is ready to take them, but they're held there for two days while and what are they doing for the two days? They're checking their baptismal credentials. And we now know from the opening of the Vatican archives how active the Vatican was in trying to communicate to the uh, Germans the uh, which of the Jews they had seized were actually had actually been baptized. And not only baptized, and this is even more surprising to me, uh, but to prove that the Jewish men who had married Catholic women and had church weddings, that is, they had pledged to have their children baptized at birth and raised as Catholic, uh, the Germans uh, would release them as well. So that two days later, when October 18th, the train uh, it rolls on to first destination, it goes directly to Auschwitz, um, the, there are just about 1,007, so there are about 250 people had been released. And who was released? It was those who could approve their baptismal credentials or the, that of their uh, wife and children. Mm -hmm. Do you think a different man, someone who might have made different choices, could have been a more effective moral leader than Pope Pius XII was? Yes, I do. I mean, as you mentioned before, my book doesn't paint a kind of black and white story of, you know, evil Pope and, and so on. Um, he was, I think one can make an argument if, you know, if I were asked to be in a debate, not to defend him, that he was in a very difficult position. Um, certainly in the first years of the war, there was good reason to believe Hitler would win the war. Uh, if you think of how easily, how uh, rapidly the German army advanced through Western Europe, for example, and drove the British off the continent and uh, took over uh, the Balkans, North Africa, and so forth. Uh, there was good reason to think from the, from the Pope's point of view that he had to uh, be careful to protect the church in a Europe that could come under the thumb of Hitler and his ally Mussolini. So I think understanding his behavior, particularly in the early years of the war, this is something one needs to keep in mind. Um, moreover, for example, at the time the Jews were being rounded up in, in Rome, it was a time of the German occupation of Rome, and the Pope was eager to maintain good relations with the occupying uh, German military forces. And so, you know, this was the, the mindset. 
Now, if um, I think there, if one thinks of what could have Pope have done, who was going to um, be courageous and stand up for human values, um, the, you know, would this have totally changed what was going on? Uh, perhaps not. But for example, I'd begin early in the war. That is uh, the, Italy's decision to enter the war. Uh, Italy did not enter the war at the beginning in uh, September 1st, 1939, with the invasion, the German invasion of Poland. They waited until June. Uh, clearly, the Pope didn't want Italy to join the war, uh, but he kept this uh, to himself. And uh, the, whereas the Germans, the majority were Protestant, albeit large minority were Catholic, um, in Italy, 99% of the population was Catholic, plus not only the Pope was uh, Italian and uh, Roman, in fact, uh, but the clergy in charge of the Vatican, that is the Curia, the Cardinals of the Curia, there are about 24, and all but one was Italian. So the Pope's influence in Italy was enormous. Of course, they had their uh, parishes, thousands of parishes through every hamlet and town in the country. Uh, so if the Pope had uh, loudly uh, objected to Mussolini entering the war and said no good Catholic could participate in this, uh, this would have been dramatic. And in fact, just the opposite happens because the uh, clergy, and it's not going to be easy, by the way, for Mussolini to convince Italians that they want to go to war on Hitler's side. They just fought a war against Germany not all that long ago in World War I, where half a million Italians were killed. Uh, the idea of um, Nazi Aryan supremacy wasn't going to appeal to uh, many Italians. Uh, so Mussolini had a problem and he needed the support of the uh, clergy, the Roman Catholic clergy in Italy, which he got. So even though uh, the Pope uh, not only is the universal spiritual leader of the church, but he's also essentially the, served as the primate, uh, the leader of the Italian church. There was no other cardinal primate as there uh, was in other countries. Uh, and the um, the day that Mussolini, June 10th, 1940, announces that he's going to war at Hitler's side, declares war in Britain and France, the uh, cardinals, the bishops of Italy, all the, the major uh, Catholic lay organizations put out calls to the population saying all good Catholics must obey um, Mussolini's call to go to war. And, uh, you know, so that... This is uh, where I think the Pope could have made a particular difference. More generally, in terms of Germany, again, you know, who was it who was murdering all the Jews? If we're talking about the Holocaust, there were people who thought they were Christian uh, and probably could justify it by what, insofar as it could be justified, uh, in terms of you know, what they knew about Jews and what they heard from uh, sermons in church and other uh, Christian religious sources. And uh, yeah, along, there were other sources as well, but these were uh, highly influential. And so uh, the, you know, the responsibility that the Pope could be seen to have uh, for this is, uh, is all the greater, I think. And that's the, you put that in a very fair way. And in the book, I really enjoyed reading the part about Mussolini's ambivalence and is his not being clear about when to enter the war and how he could be influenced by people who were close to him. It, uh, parts of it really read like a novel. Uh, I had to remind myself, that's besides the fact that it's very well written, I had to remind myself that this really happened. This was a real leader, and he was making decisions that, uh, that had a profound impact. Um, yeah, I, mean, I tried in the book to, um, so at the end of the book, I have kind of two afterwards, which talk a more in a more uh, perhaps judgmental way about uh, you know, what to make of all this. But I tried hard in the book itself to uh, just have the reader feel like they're a fly on the wall as these events were taking place on almost a day by day, you know, dramatic basis and see what was going on, who said what to, to whom. Uh, and how these decisions were made and why they were being made. So, uh, and then, to, as you say, to write in a way that would attract a broad audience, not uh, simply an academic audience. So uh, that at least was what I was trying to do. Well, you succeeded in that. 
uh, finally, David, um, how does your scholarship inform your view of today's rise of global anti-Semitism? And do you think organized religion, not just Catholicism, but the others, are uh, doing all it can to oppose it? Well, of course, first of all, it is important to say, insofar as my book was about the Vatican and, and the and part the Vatican and the Jews, that with Second Vatican Council and Nostra Aetate in 1965, all this, the attitudes of the church, of the Roman Catholic Church toward Jews uh, changed dramatically. And this has been you know, extremely important. So as bad as perhaps anti-Semitism is these days, um, the situation is dramatically improved, for, at least as far as the, the Catholic Church goes. Um, you know, one does see the dangers of demonization of another people. Uh, so this, of course, uh, tragically uh, for centuries uh, involves Jews perhaps more than uh, others, uh, but it involves not only Jews. And so I think the lesson of, uh, you know, one of the lessons from my book and of the Holocaust, I think, are that uh, even the demonization, which isn't in itself cast in murderous terms. I mean, the certainly the, the popes and the never uh, called for or wanted the you know massacre of Jews that uh, the Holocaust represented. Yet it was enabled and made possible by that demonization. So um, one does uh, those who would minimize the danger of the spreading of demonization of Jews now, anti-Semitism. Uh, I think need to pay attention to, to that history, to that danger. Uh, it does strike me that religious leaders have a special responsibility here. I mean, since Jews are a religion, uh, there's kind of a special responsibility for leaders of other religions to uh, inoculate their own flocks against uh, the demonization of Jews with anti-Semitism. And, uh, you know, we are certainly seeing a fair amount of that. But, uh, you know, as you suggest, it's, you know, these days, it's not just in the Christian world, but in other parts of the world. Uh, so not just Christian leaders, but Muslim and other leaders that uh, need to, I think, draw lessons from this history as well. The book is The Pope at War, The Secret History of Pius XII, Mussolini, and Hitler. Thank you, David, for taking the time to talk with us about your very important work. Thanks for having me. And thanks to our researcher, Bela Pasikov.